All right, good morning. My name is Sam Bird. I am a proud graduate of the University of Arkansas School of Law, class of January 1970. I'm honored today to have this opportunity to record my oral history as it relates to my law school experience and my legal career and my judicial career as this law school nears its 100th anniversary. Beginning with my early years, I was uh, born in January 19, 1940, which ironically is 81 and a half years ago today. Uh, I've, it's been a, a fully packed 81 and a half years. I was born in Arkansas, in El Dorado, Arkansas, but not because I lived there, but because my parents lived in Crossit, which was about 40 miles away but they chose to use the medical facilities in El Dorado. After 10 years of my life in CrossFit, my parents moved to Fordyce, Arkansas. I'm a fourth generation bird. My great-grandfather, my grandfather, my father were all involved in the timber harvesting and lumber management and lumber sales businesses. So I always lived where the tall pine trees Grew, as they did in Southeast Arkansas. At the age of 15, we moved to Louisiana where my dad undertook another lumber manufacturing and sales opportunity, staying there only two years when at the age of 17, we moved to Northwest Florida where my dad was hired to sell as many trees or lumber manufactured from trees as he could offer 540,000 acres of timberland in South Alabama. I graduated from high school in Florida. After graduating, I went to Florida State University, but in the summers, I always went back home and I worked two summers in the sawmill, and then I worked two summers on a, two summers on a surveying crew uh, where we surveyed the 540,000 acres that my dad was selling the timber off of it so that it could be divided among the six tenants in common who owned that timberland. I went four years to Florida State University. I graduated from there with a degree in psychology in 1962. While at FSU, I met my wife-to-be, who is now my wife of almost 59 years. We decided to get married upon my graduation, but I needed an income. A BS degree in psychology didn't attract much attention and certainly didn't uh, attract much in the way of income. So I, and I needed a break from academia, so I decided to enlist in the United States Air Force. And I applied for officer training school and we married on August 25th of 1962. I was sworn into the Air Force on November the 3rd of 1962 at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. I was sent from there to Lackland Air Force Base for three months where I became what the seasoned veteran Air Force people called a 90 day wonder. In three months, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant, United States Air Force. I had aspired to be a pilot, but my physical examination revealed that I had a heart murmur, which disqualified me from pilot training. And my second choice then was to become an intelligence communications officer, which practiced the art of intercepting foreign communications which was set off to be analyzed for its intelligence value. I completed that school in December 1963, and, it be, and because of my high ranking in that class, I got a plum assignment. I was sent to Ankara, Turkey, to serve as the Air Force Special Communications Officer in Ankara, and my job was to manage the operation of a communications center that received highly classified communications and which I then distributed out to my consumers who were the United States ambassador to Turkey, the commanding general of CENTO, 
Central Treaty Organization, of which Turkey was a member, the commanding general of the United States Mission for Military Aid to Turkey, the Army, Navy, and Air Force attaches, the commanding general of all military personnel in Ankara, which was the United States Logistics Group, and to the National Security Agency. So it was a very busy, comprehensive, very significant job. Relating my military career to my legal career, ironically, we were standing in line, in the ticket line, to go into the United States Theater in Ankara, Turkey. We struck up a conversation with a couple standing in front of us. He turned out to be the uh, base legal officer, or the JAG officer, as they, as they called them. And he and I became good friends. We, we both became good friends with he and his wife. And we remained good friends with them for, for the remainder our, of our tour in Turkey. He was a graduate of the University of South Carolina School of Law. He tried to encourage me to go back to school in South Carolina, but he also felt very strongly that a person should go to law school in the state in which they expect to practice law. And so, of course, that was very significant to me. I finished out my two and a half year commitment in the country of Turkey. Upon completion of it, I was assigned to Kelly Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas, where I finished the final 13 months of my active duty commitment. In the meantime, my family, my mother, my father, and my four siblings had returned to Arkansas. My next youngest brother, Alan Bird, was about to enter his third year of law school at the University of Arkansas. So after taking and passing the LSAT in Texas, I applied to and was admitted to the University of Arkansas Law School in Fayetteville. I did this based on his great reputation that I had researched, and of course my brother's encouragement, and then significantly because my family had returned to Arkansas and I had been gone from them for 10 years, and I was enthusiastic about it getting to know them again. I began my law school career in mid-September of 1967 at Waterman Hall, Fayetteville, Arkansas. First day was an orientation session in which we were introduced to faculty and staff and the dean and, and admonished about uh, the behavior that was expected and what we were expected to uh, do to study and be prepared and, and go to class. The first day of class began at 8 a.m. I don't remember the date, but I remember well that my first professor was James Gallman teaching Property 101. Most of my classmates did not like property law. They found it boring difficult to understand, confusing. To the contrary, I loved it. Remember my earlier conversation about my surveying experience in South Alabama. I knew what a baseline and a township line were. I knew the meaning and the lengths of links and chains. I knew the dimensions of an acre. I knew the meaning of the phrase tenants in common. I enjoyed property law, and on my final exam, I wrote the top paper in the class, and I was awarded a volume of CJS by Professor Gallman, and I have kept it to this day as a, as a memento of that accomplishment. Of course, everyone's favorite professor back at that time was Al Witte. He was the epitome of his name. He was witty. He was entertaining, he was challenging, he was motivating, he inspired you to learn. And after I completed, he, and that was in contracts, first one-on-one contracts. And after that, when I came to choosing electives as the semesters went forward, I chose not by the name of the course, but by whether it was being taught by Professor Whitty. 
And I think I took everything he taught in the two and a half years it took me to finish that course of training. Of course, Dr. Leffler was also a legend. He scared every freshman to death in Torts 101. Everyone shook for fear that he was going to find their name in his little black book. And when they did, they stuttered and attempted to answer his question. None of us did so very effectively because we were so nervous. And then if we managed to stay there two more years, we got to take conflicts of law under Dr. Leffler. Mark Gittleman was also one of my favorites. He was an authority on land use. He taught a course in land use control and other similar type courses. Of course, my love for the law of the land uh, encouraged me to uh, take those courses. Professor Guzman, the first class he ever taught was the first criminal law class that I ever took. This was his first year of teaching, his very first class. He taught uh, criminal law. Of course, we were as nervous as he was, or he was as nervous as we were, but he was great. Uh, Professor Gallman, who I've also mentioned, was a little bit dry, but after all, we were taking his course at 8 o'clock in the morning, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Professor Spees was our evidence teacher. He was entertaining. He was excellent. He was just a very good teacher. Professor Robert Wright taught uh, decedent estates and similar courses. Uh, these weren't the most exciting courses we ever took, but he was excellent at it. And of course, he is very scholarly and has written many law-related articles. Finally, T.J. McDonough taught business-related courses. I think I took a course under him on the Uniform Commercial Code. He wasn't real punctual about getting his work done, and at the end of the semester, we would always be standing out before the bulletin board looking for our grades to be posted, and we oftentimes did not see his. One time after the UCC course, the, some of the class members said, why don't we go up and ask him when he's going to post his grades? So we went up the two flights of stairs, and his stair was right at the top of the first flight on the second floor of the Waterman building. And we stuck our head in the door and said, Professor McDonough, we were just wondering when we might get our grades uh, from our final exam in the UCC course. And he looked over at a table that was besides his desk. He stood up, he walked over, he picked up the stack of papers, blue books and various other documents. And he walked over to the door and he took them and he tossed them down the steps. And he said, okay, there you go. Those that are on the first step made an A. Those that are on the second step made a B. Third step made a C, fourth step made a D, and the rest of you failed. And then he walked back in his office and said, now get out of here. So we did, and we got out of there really early. Of course, he was putting on an act. That's not the way the grades came out, but uh, we got out of there in a hurry and uh, that is kind of an indication of the nature and the sense of humor of T.J. McDonough. He got along real good with students. He played golf with us some. He liked to interact with <coughs> students on a personal basis. I had numerous memorable events while I was in law school. During my fourth semester, I was elected to be president of the Student Bar Association, and part of my duty was to arrange for a program for Law Day. I had an appointment with Dean Barnhart to talk about our speaker alternatives, and he looked at me and said, you know, there's a lawyer who lives down in Charleston, Arkansas, whom I understand makes a great speech and tells funny stories. Why don't we contact him? His name is Dale Bumpers. Of course, I'd never heard of Dale Bumpers, but I thought if the dean recommended him, I would certainly agree to that. The dean contacted him. He did. He spoke. He gave a funny speech and told a lot of funny stories. But the thing that's most memorable to me about that occasion was he never forgot who I was. You remember, Dale became governor of Arkansas. He then became a United States senator. 
and every time I saw him, he knew me by my first name, always spoke. First time was when I was going to a football game in War Memorial Stadium with my wife and a couple of friends. We were walking up the aisle and I heard somebody yelling, Sam, hey Sam, looked over there and it was Dale Bofors standing up and, and waving at me. The next time was in Monticello. He was campaigning, I can't remember which office, probably governor, and he saw me in the crowd and he yelled out to me, hollered my name out, came over and spoke to me again. And then finally the next time I was vacationing in Washington, D.C., went to the United States Capitol, went to the foyer, to the Senate chambers, where we were required to provide our name and state of residence, and I gave it to him. And with it, within a very few minutes, here came Dale Bumpers out into the foyer of the Senate, speaking again and calling me by name. And needless to say, this is a most memorable uh, incident for me. I graduated in two and a half years January 1970, like I said, five semesters and two summers went continuously straight through with the highest grade point average in my graduating class. Now, let me be honest with you. I did not graduate with the class with which I began, so I don't want to steal anybody's thunder. The top GPA in my starting graduating class was Jerry Canfield and second, I think, was John Everett, and, and then I think maybe Tom Daly also finished ahead of me. So I was not the number one student in my starting class that I went to school with continuously, except graduating a little early. I was the top GPA that graduated in January of 1970. And interestingly, nobody ever told me that. I got no awards for it and didn't expect any and wouldn't have known about it except for a brief article that appeared in the spring 1970 edition of the Arkansas Law Review where in less than a column they talked about the graduating class of January 1970. Being a married man at the time didn't have a big social life or interaction with my fellow students occasionally being able to stop and have a beer at Maxine's uh, with my classmates. Then my first child, our first child, was born on November the 3rd of 1968. So this was in my second year of law school. Needless to say, that cut back a little bit on my social activities and interaction with my students. But I did play golf at uh, Paradise Valley Golf Course in Fayetteville with a good friend of mine who went to school with me, started and finished with me and practices law here in Little Rock. His name is Randy Coleman. And he was formerly a member of the University of Arkansas golf team. I also had three jobs at least. I worked in the law library. I worked as a law clerk during my senior year for the McAllister Wade Burke law firm I worked as a ticket scalper hunter, being employed by George Cole, a legendary coach at the University of Arkansas. That involved going out into the crowds before football games and finding people who were trying to sell their tickets for more than the face value. I was deputized by the Washington County Sheriff's Department and actually conducted arrests of those people. I didn't take him into custody. I called a real deputy who came to the scene and attended to that business, but that was an interesting job. I did anything that was legal and that paid money to get me through those two and a half years of law school. I also had the GI Bill, which paid my rent. As law school was winding down, I interviewed with law firms around Arkansas, Fayetteville, Springdale, Little Rock, even San Antonio. But there was a small law firm, small but highly respected law firm in Monticello, Arkansas, referred to as the Williamson Firm. 
they were looking for a trial lawyer and because of the opportunity it presented to me to get back home to where my family lived, from which I said, as I said, I'd been gone 10 years, I decided to accept that position. For the next 21 years, I engaged in the general practice of law with emphasis on trial work, civil, criminal, jury, non-jury, chancery, circuit, with even the bonus of representing one of the local banks that did a substantial real estate loan practice, which enabled me to use my love of land law, uh, which I had acquired in my youth. In 1988, the legislature created a third judgeship in the 10th Circuit Judicial District, which was made up of Ashley, Bradley, Chico, Deche, and Drew County. It was a combination circuit chancery judgeship with the added responsibility for juvenile court. Coincidentally, I had also had juvenile judging experience because constitutionally the county judge in Arkansas was required to perform the task of juvenile judging. In 1972, the county judges prevailed upon the legislature to enable them or to allow them to appoint a referee to perform the juvenile judging function. I was two years out of law school. Our county judge in Drew County asked me if I would serve as the juvenile referee in Drew County, and I said that I would. I did. I did it for a number of years. So the new judgeship, which was a combination of chancery, circuit, and juvenile, just seemed like a natural fit for me. I ran for the position in 1990. I was opposed. It was a close race that I won in a squeaker, which is the subject of another, of another day. I, I served four years. I was reelected to a second term unopposed. In 1996, Judge Melvin Mayfield of El Dorado retired from the 5th District Court of Appeals. It was a 14-county district, which included the five counties I mentioned earlier. I decided to run for that position. I had another contested race. I had two opponents, one from Pine Bluff, one from El Dorado, which are the densest population areas in my district in Southeast Arkansas. It also involved a runoff, and in November 1996, I won that position, which I served in for 12 years, retiring on December 31 of 2008. Since I have retired from that position, I have retained my law license. I have once been appointed as a special justice of the Arkansas Supreme Court. I have twice been appointed as a circuit judge to sit in the place where all of the judges in the affected district or the involved district disqualified themselves. And needless to say, those were interesting and controversial cases. I have once been appointed as a special master of the Supreme Court to hear a challenge to the validity of a petition to amend the Constitution, and I am currently sitting by appointment as a special judge on the Arkansas Court of Appeals. I remain as judicially active as I want to be. I keep in touch with the judges, the lawyers, and the law. I'm a member of the Bar Association and was celebrated last year as a 50-year member of that association. And as I said, I have retained my law license. So far, that's my history. And that's, like I said, it has been fully packed, enjoyable, and interesting. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to relate this to you.